One of my concerns is how little notice has been given to consumers about the removal of AM radios and vehicles. Some companies claim to have announced the phase out of AM radios, but we've also heard reports that consumers are not aware that their new car doesn't have AM radio until after they've left the auto lot. In fact, a dealership in my district even told me that they had no idea about the change. And I'm, uh, I also want to say uh, thanks to Ford for its uh, change of uh, saying that the AM radio will be put back in their vehicles and also being able to be downloaded in vehicles that are already off the line or in heavens uh, so to consumers. Mr. Schmidt, <clears throat> excuse me, should vehicle manufacturers be responsible to alert consumers when AM radio, a critical safety function of the vehicle, is not included in the model before it's purchased? Can you repeat that a little louder? Right. I did have a hard time. Uh, should vehicle manufacturers be responsible to alert consumers when AM radio, a critical safety function in the vehicle, is not included in that model before it's purchased? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I cannot comment on individual what manufacturers can do, but I can certainly reinforce the fact that our members view um, that there are more options for delivering content and alerts now in vehicles than there ever were, and that we are committed to providing these alerts free of charge to our, our customers through those vehicles. Um, Thank you. Mr. Chapman, how do you uh, how do you think the removal of AM radios from your car from cars will lessen the reach and local impact of your broadcast channel? Chairman Latta, thank you for that question. Uh, it will absolutely uh, impact our reach in a significant way. Most of the radio listening is done in the car. Um, this is a, a business concern uh, for uh, many of our businesses in uh, say Delphus. Uh, we have uh, people that were the primary source of advertising for them, so they come to us to, use, to, to move their products. Um, so there's obviously a business reason for us, but there's a business reason for the community. And in addition to that, uh, if AM radio is not in cars, it's the primary point uh, that begins the alert system, so it's a safety issue too. People won't be able to hear the alerts the way the EAS system is set up. I know it's a little bit early for me for everything to be uh, noticed out there with the change, but have uh, you noticed a change in listenership right now in your station or stations? So, Chairman Lada, at this point, uh, it's very early in the process. We have not seen changes, but I can tell you it will be significant because the radio is the primary entry point for people listening to it. And that's where people consume most of the radio. And so uh, if it's not in the car, it would be a significant issue for people hearing alerts or hearing news from local businesses. Well, let me follow up. Uh, we hear from many uh, auto manufacturers about how streaming AM radio is the future and there will no longer be a need for an analog or HD AM radio. What are your thoughts on that characterization? So, uh, for example, all of the Wolf Boom stations stream. But I can also tell you that streaming is uh, part of our future, but it's not all of our future. Uh, as uh, consumers listen to the stream, they might be hearing in an area that is far off. And so if they're hearing that stream, they're not getting EAS alerts for the area that are important, uh, that is the area of where they're actually residing at the time. And so uh, one of our concerns, if it's only streaming, we are still uh, running outside of the structure of the EAS system. EAS works with AM radio because AM radio can work in times where the power has gone away. Uh, AM radio can work in times of disaster, whether they are hurricanes or tornadoes. And uh, if a station is streaming, it is delivered over the internet and which is dependent on the power grid and also uh, other factors when cell networks go down. This is all part of streaming. So it is not a substitute for what we have, which is our primary uh, delivery system. Well, thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, let me ask in my last 25 seconds here, when you do your planning, because years ago when I was a county commissioner with our emergency management, we always have planning sessions. Do you plan for if the internet goes down, what happens then in your communications? I'm sorry, you have about 12 seconds left. Absolutely, sir. We have to plan for every contingency because Murphy's Law is governing much of our business and uh, failure of those networks is anticipated. 
Right, I appreciate that, and I thank our witnesses. And my time has expired, and the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, the general lady from California, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think about the AM radio, and it's something that most of us have grown up with, and a lot of things that we take for granted in this country, and probably AM radio is one of them. And uh, not only do we think about it and listening to radios and cars and things like that, but the fact of the matter today is that as we look at communications, it's become a very vital part of uh, what we do and for emergency purposes. Um, and rural areas like parts of my district, cell service can be spotty and simply non-existent. In these areas, alternative methods of communications help ensure that all residents have access to information when and where they need it. And I must say, not only in rural areas too, but in urban areas of which I have a great part of also. Um, what I was thinking about is, is that, um, can you describe Lieutenant Colonel DeMays, the dis limitations of the other emergency alert systems when cell service or power goes down? And I think we can imagine it, but how that would happen. Uh, thank you for the question, ma'am. Uh, certainly, during these weather events that we've experienced in New Jersey and uh, nationally with high winds, uh, destructive forces such as earthquakes um, and other just snow load and, and heavy rains, we have lost cellular communications pretty frequently. And unfortunately, um, we've become so devoted to them that we kind of lose sight of the fact that we do need to rely on other mechanisms to communicate with the public. So as mentioned uh, in Chairman Lattis question, I wasn't able to quite you know, maybe expand upon, uh, we require that redundancy to make sure that we can communicate with all of the community. And the AM radio platform certainly has such a broad reach and is re reliable and uh, robust uh, that we've leveraged that many, many times to communicate with a broad spectrum of people in both those rural areas and in the urban areas throughout the state. Right, absolutely. Um, the frequency used by AM radio are, is different than FM or those used to power our phones. While they have some limitations, they also have strengths that have helped AM radio reach consumers across the country. Mr. Chapman, can you describe the unique characteristics of AM radio frequencies and while they are so well suited to emergency announcements? Thank you, Congresswoman. The um, AM band is somewhat different than, for example, the FM band. AM waves are much longer. The uh, FM waves are much shorter. And in uh, layman's terms, what this means is they can travel greater distances. They can also penetrate things like uh, hills, mountains, and such. And so uh, many years ago, when FEMA and broadcasters decided, what do we want as the primary point to activate the emergency alert system, they selected AM stations for this very reason. So the entry point to begin a national alert is primarily AM stations and for example, the one that is in my area that reaches all of the Midwest is uh, WLW, and it covers some 17 states. And uh, this is the reason AM is so central to the EAS. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm talking local economy, whether on TV or radio, local broadcasters provide opportunities for smaller businesses to reach consumers in their community, especially in smaller media markets. This can be an engine for economic growth. Mr. Chapman, can you talk about the opportunities AM radio provides for smaller local businesses? How would those opportunities be limited if AM radio were removed from all vehicles? Um, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Once again, it's a question of access. And so uh, I mentioned a radio station that we have in Anderson, Indiana. During the middle of COVID, we went on the air and, you know, in the old days of doing a radiothon, we started selling cards, gift cards to businesses to put the money back into the community. Um, so that is central how it's the economic engine a lot of times, and that's an easy example to understand. Um, one that's uh, also uh, important is there's diverse listening that was mentioned somewhat uh, earlier. I was fortunate uh, a number of years ago to be a general uh, sales manager for a black gospel station in Indianapolis. And that radio station was central to that community. 
um, not only the businesses, but the information that was communicated to the people uh, that listened to that radio station. So it was important uh, as they saw the information that came through the radio at that time as credible and reliable. And that's an important relationship that exists between a radio station and its listener base. Okay, thank you very much, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. She yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a very important hearing. I appreciate you holding this. And also, I want to thank the ranking member, and uh, thanks for the testimony as well from the panel. Uh, as we kick off hurricane season this month, I'm reminded of the all too familiar situation for residents in my state of Florida. The electric is out, the internet is down, the cell phone coverage is shoddy at best. And if people heard my PSAs over the years, they would know to have an emergency handheld radio at the ready. But if not, they head to their cars to reestablish a connection to their community, hear about the devastation of the storm, and heed any direction from emergency services, uh, service authorities. So my question, first question is to uh, Lieutenant Colonel, to the Lieutenant Colonel, what benefits do AM signals have over FM signals during and in the aftermath of a natural disaster such as a hurricane? AM signals uh, in and of themselves have much broader reach, as mentioned before in prior testimony here today, that they can reach greater distances uh, than the FM signals can. Uh, so we can penetrate some of those more rural areas, uh, but also, as mentioned, uh, the ability to also penetrate you know, buildings within some of those urban centers is, is makes, it, makes it certainly a little bit more uh, amenable to those types of messaging. Very good. Thank you. In uh, 2016 legislation, I authored to modernize the uh, FEMA's iPod system became law. That legislation improved the effectiveness of the texting system for uh, future emergency situations and implemented training requirements for state officials. It also relied heavily on the emergency alarm system and AM radio signals to work quickly and effectively. So again, Lieutenant Colonel, in your professional capacity, do you foresee potential delays to emergency information getting to citizens as a result of lesser access to AM radios? Uh, and it is, a, is it possible to replicate our EAS system without the use of AM signals? And this is so very important, as you know, I mean, uh, we could lose lives uh, without, the, without the AM radio. Uh, so please, if you could uh, respond to that, I appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, yes, so I would agree that to lose the access to AM radio signals uh, certainly would impede the messaging getting out, uh, whether it is a cellular network collapse, a power outage uh, that impacts the cellular infrastructure. Uh, the potential is that those messages in text form would be cached and not delivered directly to the people that might need them. Uh, certainly, we need all platforms available uh, to our residents because, you know, some people are more comfortable listening to AM uh, radio stations to obtain their information. And we want to have all messaging platforms available. So any delays in getting that message out in that critical moment certainly could be a matter of, of life and death uh, as a part of the emergency alert system. Absolutely. Uh, and, and then uh, getting into the entertainment aspect. Uh, people are used to, particularly in the rural areas, and I represent rural areas, um, not all of my district, but quite a bit, two counties, uh, and they are used to, the people are used to listening to AM radio. That's where they get their news. Uh, and uh, I tell you what, if, if we don't save uh, AM radio, Mr. Chairman, um, I tell you what, it would be very devastating for a lot of people, particularly our seniors. And, and I'll add that uh, I love to listen to AM radio, uh, listen to baseball games. Uh, and and it, radio is, actually baseball is a radio sport if you can't go to the game. So uh, that's from a selfish point of view. But in any case, uh, 
This is a serious issue, and I really appreciate you having this hearing. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank, Thank you. you. The gentleman yields back, but I think your team's doing better than it did last year. <laughs> well, here we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the chair now recognizes the my in order here. Let's see here. The gentlelady from California's 16th district for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the ranking member for holding this hearing today. Thank you to the witnesses. Uh, there's no question that many Americans value uh, AM radio, which is why it's been a standard feature in cars for so many years. Uh, while drivers now uh, have several options for uh, listening to music, podcasts, and other entertainment while driving, the backlash to uh, Ford removing AM radio, which they've now walked back, uh, shows there's still um, a really robust uh, consumer demand for this feature. Uh, just as importantly, I think this episode shows that uh, automakers are responsive uh, to the demand. Uh, that's how the free market is supposed to work. While there are many features uh, drivers may want in their cars, uh, the only ones mandated uh, by the federal government uh, are those intended to keep us safe. Uh, two of the witnesses uh, today have endorsed legislation mandating AM radio as a safety feature to ensure the public can receive uh, emergency alerts during natural disasters and other emergencies. Uh, NHTSA has more than a dozen outstanding safety regulations mandated by Congress that it has yet to implement, and some of them uh, have been pending for more than a decade. I think uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee needs to get after uh, NHTSA. Uh, uh, before we add to that list, uh, I think we need to be sure that any additional mandates are truly needed to improve safety and uh, safe lives on the road. Uh, to Colonel uh, DeMays, uh, is AM radio the only means for, um, or primary means by which uh, drivers can receive emergency alerts through the integrated uh, public alerts and warning system? Um, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Uh, they can receive messaging through the FM uh, system as well. And also, uh, if they have a cellular device available to them, certainly they could receive messaging through that platform as well. Thank you. The wireless emergency uh, alert system. Thank you. Uh, to Mr. Schmidt, what are the potential unintended uh, consequences of Congress mandating uh, the use of a specific uh, technology to receive uh, emergency alerts? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, as you're well aware, uh, mandates and regulations are blunt instruments. Um, and so it's important that we look at the cost and benefit over a uh, future. And one of the things that FEMA has noted is that there is declining lis listenership. And part of the whole iPod system is looking at the future in terms of what new technologies are going to be able to supplement maybe AM, uh, potentially in the future even replace AM and also to deliver more effective um, alerts. So we are very technology agnostic in the sense that we are looking for delivering the alerts to our members, to our customers, as efficiently as possible, as broadly as possible, in the most efficient manner, and in a manner that's not going to decline in the future um, and will provide the benefits uh, well into the future. Thank you. Is there a, uh, this to any of the witnesses, uh, is there a technology uh, neutral approach Congress can take to ensure that all drivers have access to emergency alerts? Yes. If, if Congresswoman, if I may answer that sure. for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, FEMA many years ago, uh, as they were constructing the current model for the EAS plan, used AM radio stations as and I referenced this earlier as the primary entry point. And they did that for a couple of reasons. Number one, we've already talked about the distances that AM radio stations travel, um, but it's also some of the characteristics. So um, in the event of a significant disaster that we haven't experienced, these stations reach more than 90% of the United States. So they're the central point. And so there's not another technology 
or another medium right now that's ready to step in and replace that. Mm -hmm. Any other witness here to? Uh, Congressman, I agree with this statement. It really is, as, you, as was mentioned, several uh, witnesses today stating that it is the backbone of the emergency alert system. It's the most consistent, uh, dependable platform with which we have to communicate with the public. Yeah, I just kind of just make a mention that, you know, they, my understanding from reading some of the FEMA documents is that the EIS system is a fairly cost-intensive system to maintain. And I think the key thing is how do we make that more cost effective as we move forward? And as we look at, assist, at uh, technologies that may be declining, we need to find alternatives that can address that in a more cost efficient manner and still deliver the safety benefits. Why is Thank it you. so expensive? I don't know. I just noted it in there. Um, well, first off, I think the idea is that you have these hardened stations. Um, and, and like I said, they're not just AM stations, they're other stations. And uh, I don't have the specifics on that, but it is in the uh, inner documents. And if you want, I can probably pull that reference and get it back to you, and that would be helpful. I'd appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Thank you to the witnesses. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady's time has expired and yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady of the full committee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the announcement, Mr. Schmidt, in the announcement Ford made on May 23rd, they stated, Quote, for any owners of 2023 Ford EVs currently without AM broadcast capability, we'll offer an over-the-air software update to make it available. How was Ford able to turn on AM broadcast capability with the flip of a switch while other car manufacturers are not? Thank you for the question. Um, let me give you uh, Ford's, what they told us, and I think they mentioned this to the community as well, because in their May 23rd announcement, CEO Jim Farley announced that after speaking with policy leaders about the importance of AM broadcast radio as a part of the emergency alert system, Ford decided to include it on all 2024 Ford and Lincoln vehicles. And for any owners of 2023 model year Ford EVs that did not initially offer AM radio, they will offer a software update. It's my understanding from discussions with Ford representatives that Ford started removing AM radio by disabling the software while they worked to, on a longer lead time modification that would actually remove the hardware. So for those models, Ford can, in, can enable the AM radio by, via the over-the-air update. However, I can't really speak to any of the Ford's plans for post-2024 at this point. Are you aware of any other auto manufacturers who are choosing not to provide AM radio despite having the technology and the capability to do so? I haven't, we haven't done a census to see which vehicle manufacturers are or not. This has been something that manufacturers look at customer preferences very closely. And so they do a lot of market research and try to determine what, how to deliver the most value to the customers. Okay, thank you. Do you have, do, you, uh, do any of the companies in your group plan to charge extra for AM, FM radios and cars through a subscription service? Yeah, I really can't talk about, you know, content. I talk about the safety. And so we're committed to providing free alerts. Um, as far as the content, there's, as, as you know, in, in, in any, um, in this realm, there's a lot of free content, a lot of subscription content for everything. So. Again, that's a consumer preference, a marketing thing that our manufacturers look at. But I can say that we reaffirm that we are committed to ensuring drivers have access to free public alerts and safety warnings through the iPod system. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chapman, a, a large portion of the most popular AM radio shows feature either conservative or religious content. From your perspective, what effect will the removal of AM radios from cars have on the diversity of thought in the broadcasting space. Thank you for that question, Congresswoman. Uh, I'll pull on a couple of examples. I have a station in Muncie, Indiana. It's WMUN. We recently reprogrammed this station. Uh, it's somewhat cost intensive, um, but we focus on local community issues. It's important that we have a place for the fourth estate to act, to talk about public issues. Uh, like a lot of the communities in the Rust Belt, uh, this town has been somewhat challenged over the years. But if there's not the place with the declining forms of other media to discuss these things, we can't depend on social media to help a community shape its decision. So it's a role that we need to play 
as a broadcaster, and that's something that AM stations do really well. I'd referenced a little bit earlier that when I was a general sales manager of an urban formatted station in Indianapolis, we worked very hard to address issues that were specific to our station um, and our audience. Um, I've got a good friend who operates a radio station. He's a member of NABOB in Evansville, Indiana, Atlanta, WEOA, and his station uh, puts information out that would not be received by his listeners in that community because there are not other sources for it. So the diversity of voice and the diversity of thought is very important, and the AM band does that better than any of our other vehicles. Thank you for those insights. Uh, another question, the U.S. has invested significant capital into hardening certain AM radio broadcast stations to prepare for a variety of crisis scenarios. Can you speak to what goes into the process of hardening in the AM station? So as a, thank you again for the question. As a general rule, um, each station, each opportunity for FEMA and that broadcaster is unique. For example, if it's a station that's in, uh, on the Gulf, uh, it, it might be on stilts and up in the air if a hurricane comes through. That's to protect it because in the past when that's happened, for example, during Katrina, um, stations were not able to stay on. So that investment has been made. Uh, generally, with any PEP station, which is, again, the primary entry point, uh, 30 to 60 days of alternate power are at each one of those facilities. So um, it's very different than might uh, a station in the Midwest that might be set up to survive some type of a terrorist act, such as an EMP or something like that. That's a lead-encased facility. So it depends on the radio station, and I know that's not a direct answer, but each one of these stations is somewhat different in terms of its requirements. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I yield back. Thank you. The general lady yields back, and the chair now recognizes the general from New Jersey, the ranking member of the full committee for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. In times of emergency with the stakes so high, we can't ignore the fact that reducing the, the number of platforms and technologies available to us for warning the public makes the job of emergency managers and first responders that much more difficult. So let me ask Colonel DeMaze, why is AM radio a critical piece of the public warning system in New Jersey, and why is it short-sighted to reduce the number of options available to public officials for communicating with the public in future disasters? Thank you, Congressman. The, the redundancy as a major tenant of emergency management is something you know we try to focus in on. We need to have multiple platforms available to us, whether it's power uh, delivery, uh, we have generators or other sources of energy for homes, water being bottled water, water buffaloes, et cetera. And from a communication standpoint, we want the maximum amount of platforms available that meets the users where they're at. The AM radio platform is again, highly accepted by its audience uh, and trusted for that matter. And we want to communicate with uh, those individuals through that platform if they're not maybe paying attention to those cellular platforms, television, et cetera. So we lose that connectivity with that very large audience uh, during a crisis. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Let me go to Mr. Schmidt. I, I was glad to see you emphasized your member company's commitment to ensuring drivers access to free public alerts and safety warnings. I did not, however, hear a commitment to ensuring access to free information and entertainment like that currently enjoyed from broadcast radio. And while I appreciate those who point out that most radio stations are available to stream via apps on our phones or through the vehicles, these suggestions ignore a simple reality that not everyone has or can afford unlimited cellular data plans to support that level of sustained usage or additional subscriptions for their cars. So we don't want this to be another issue exacerbated by the digital divide. So my, my question, Mr. Schmidt, is how will people without unlimited data plans or paid auto connectivity subscriptions access broadcast radio content without the standard antenna in the vehicle? Thank you for your question. Um, again, as I reiterate, um, consumers have never had so many choices in where they get their content and information, including alerts. Um, I can't comment on necessarily what would be subscription or not subscription. However, I will say that we, our commitment is that there will be free options in that vehicle. And even within things that do have subscriptions, such as satellite, their alerts are free on their base channels. So they're provided without 
um, fee, even if you don't choose to subscribe. Thank you. I mean, the problem, though, you know, is that we know that with AM, I mean, it's essentially free. Um, we don't know how people who have limited means are going to be able to use some of these other things that might have a subscription or, um, you know, limit. They might have, they may not have unlimited cellular data plans. So I understand what you're saying, but I also think that, you know, we have, in the case of broadcast radio and AM station, we know that that's not something they have to pay for. Um, let me go to, um, uh, to Mr. Chapman. Can you describe what would happen if your business had to rely primarily on streaming broadcasts? How about the hardship streaming would place on working people who regularly tune into your stations while commuting to and from their jobs? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, a number of our listeners would no longer hear our stations. Uh, the easiest way to consume our product is free over the air radio. Um, a streaming option is something that all of our stations have, but it's not that way for all broadcasters. There's a cost that goes with streaming. So for smaller broadcasters, uh, for smaller operators, a standalone radio station, they may not have that option. So it would be a significant hit for our business. Um, it would lower our reach, and we're talking about safety here. We're not as going to be accessible, um, but for some broadcasters, it would end their business model. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and the charter now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, public safety, uh, public benefits beyond safety, two pillars of what we're hearing about the importance of AM radio. Uh, Top-down mandates are not, I believe, the way to approach this issue. But it's important that we properly identify uh, what AM radio means for our constituents and the impact that uh, its removal from vehicles would have. Um, I think the fact that AM is free is something that ought to cause all of us to sit up, sit up and take notice. And thank you uh, to the panel. Thank you for uh, dealing with our concerns, our ideas, and questions today. Um, the free service that AM offers requires no internet connection, reaches parts of the country and people that streaming and other services cannot for various reasons. Um, this is how people in rural areas like my district uh, get their news. They connect with their religion. They raise money for local causes. They take part in diverse conversations that they might not otherwise have access to. Uh, Mr. Chapman, over half of all people only listen to radio in the car. I listen in the shower as well. We'll leave it there. Additionally, AM, FM radio is still the top listened to media in cars over, over both streaming and satellite services combined. Uh, not all automakers have plans to eliminate AM receivers, and thank you to Ford, I think, for listening, and I hope they will continue to listen to that and expand the whole network of free radio by doing so. How could the rhetoric around removal impact investment in and availability of AM radio programs? Congressman, could you repeat that very last part of your question, please? Uh, I was asking how the continued rhetoric around removal of AM uh, impact investment and avail availability. So, uh, you know, as, as far as the, Congressman, thank you for the question. As far as the view or the rhetoric, um, uh, you know, it obviously uh, would look, you know, for anybody uh, wanting to invest in our sector, question what's going on. But I, th I think the bigger question for us is, as an industry right now is how do we make sure that we can connect with people at all times who want to receive us, um, and we know um, that we do the best when we are uh, received over the air uh, through the channels that are easiest for people to receive it. So, um, you know, uh, we've made a concerted effort to be available everywhere uh, for uh, people so they can consume our product, but the vast majority of listening that occurs to radio stations is where it's broadcast free and over the air. Yeah, and that's an investment option that ought to be trumpeted. 
Mr. Chapman, um, Michigan has a rich AM history. In fact, the first commercial radio station in the country started here, or started there. I guess I'm always living in Michigan. Our AM stations cover things important to Michiganders, uh, whether it's a fundraiser for the local Salvation Army, uh, or minute-by-minute -minute updates on flooding in the state, or now wildfires up in, in the northern reaches of our state. Uh, there's been a trend towards uh, media con consolidation for decades, making news less local. That wouldn't work in Crawford County right now with the fires if we weren't local. What is the AM radio's role in local news and keeping people in rural areas informed? Congressman, we have made significant investments uh, in our news operation. I'll touch on those in a second. We started our company uh, on the premise that locally owned and uh, locally managed radio uh, where we operate is the right way to serve the community. Um, that is our business model. Um, we know that we need to continue to invest in our news. We've uh, upped the staff in that. Um, we operate in small communities and we also operate in rural areas. So the news aspect and the information aspect that we provide the community is an important part of our service. That's why many of the people in our organization come to work every day. They see that as a role to serve the community. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, uh, how much does it cost to include an AM radio receiver in a newer electric vehicle? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have cost information that is specific to vehicle manufacturers and is also is very specific to the vehicle design. I can say there's probably a range um, because some of the issues with interference may be more and more or less uh, prevalent, but I don't have any specific cost information. Sorry. That leaves us at a loss as well because we don't understand it. So thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida's 9th District for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In my first couple of years in the Congress, we had Hurricane Irma, which uh, <clears throat> pummeled Central Florida with heavy winds and some rains, and we saw trees down everywhere. Uh, we got hit again with Hurricane Ian just recently. Uh, this time it was more flooding and uh, standing water for many days. And we often tell our constituents, as does the state that, and our local governments, that we need to be prepared, uh, have adequate supplies. And one of those key supplies is a battery-powered radio. Uh, it's right there on our list, on the federal list, on the state list, because redundancy is critical, uh, especially for our emergency alert system. Cell phone towers, cable, electricity uh, can all go down. And AM is the last line of defense when we're talking about critical information, evacuations, power outages, down power lines, curfews, flooding, um, need of help uh, to clear the way for our first responders. And AM is also a key part of uh, our Hispanic culture. Uh, many of my constituents access Spanish language programming, news, culture, music, uh, through AM radio. And it's only heightened uh, in uh, our US territories, uh, all of which are islands like Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and Guam. Uh, when all else fails, AM seems to be there to pick up the slack uh, during a lot of these natural disasters. Obviously, a lot of us were concerned when um, major auto manufacturers uh, had, had started considering phasing out AM radio. Uh, some have reversed course, like Ford, and we appreciate that. We uh, encourage others to follow suit. Mr. Chapman, when, when all else fails, how essential is AM radio uh, during a natural disaster? Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, the central point in a large disaster depends on PEP, or primary entry point stations. The majority of those, 75%, our AM radio stations. And again, it was the design of the system at that point in time, which they continue to evolve today, that they made it uh, essential for AM radio stations because of the things we've already discussed to be part of that. Um, uh, in more recent times, uh, when we're dealing with local alerts, it's only the AM stations that go into great detail. Two quick examples. Uh, recently in Alexandria, which is just north of Anderson, Indiana, uh, twice uh, in one month, we had what we believed was an active shooter in a school. It was only our AM radio station explaining at length with reporters on site what was actually happening 
to keep the public calm because it was not what was being put on social media. In that example, it's a prime situation of how AM radio serves in a time of need. Uh, just a few weeks ago, in mid-May, in Lima, Ohio, uh, the prison there had two extremely dangerous felons escape. Uh, in that moment, it was our stations and our AM station that were providing not just alerts, but were providing the background and the information so businesses and different organizations could keep their population safe. Thank you so much. Uh, Lieutenant DeMay, Lieutenant Colonel DeMays, uh, how critical is uh, AM radio stations for new vo vo motor vehicles for ability of Spanish-speaking communities in New Jersey or in my home state of Florida or others to receive emergency alerts? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. As mentioned, uh, we'd like to message out where those communities are at and the AM uh, radio stations being able to share those messages with our people is, is of critical importance. From a motor vehicle standpoint, it's not uncommon, as in the case of Hurricane Sandy, for us to engage in evacuations of areas. And having that ability to communicate with people that are on the move uh, when cellular networks may have been compromised uh, due to high winds or other destructive measures, uh, or in the case where there's power outages, and those systems maybe aren't able to uh, leverage and, and communicate properly, the AM platform provides us with a great deal of connectivity with those in the community that are on the move. And in some cases, as we've seen uh, anecdotally, uh, people sheltering in their cars. I mean, maybe uh, they had to move to higher ground. That radio tends to be their situational awareness of the environment around them, of what the conditions are, if they may be in an area that might not have a good view of what's happening in the real world. And Lieutenant Colonel, whether it's the Florida Turnpike or the New Jersey Turnpike, how many folks do you have coming in from out of state who may not be aware of uh, some of the natural disasters that may be occurring? That's a, a good question, Chairperson. Uh, the, the New Jersey Turnpike uh, sees uh, somewhere over a million, I think, riders a day, uh, you know, on, on, a, on a good day. Um, so I couldn't actually answer, you know, that, that aspect. But again, having, you know, those alerts on our signbirds telling people where to go to get critical information, we tend to tell people to go to AM radio stations. Thanks. My time's expired. The gentleman time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, the vice chair of the subcommittee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you for being here. I appreciate it very much. Um, as the chairman mentioned, I'm from Georgia. I have the honor and privilege of representing the entire coast of Georgia. Obviously, hurricanes are a concern to us. Obviously, the emergency management system is important. Um, you know, one thing to note also, for those of you who may not be familiar with Georgia, that we always say there are two Georgias. There's Atlanta and everywhere else. Well, we're everywhere else in South Georgia, um, you know, so access to, to, to AM radio is important to us and, and very important. But, um, you know, natural disasters like hurricanes are, are traumatic and oftentimes there's no other means of getting alerts other than the AM radio. So I'm glad to see that companies such as Ford are, um, have reversed their decision to, to remove AM radio in, in, in their EVs based on this information, and I'm hopeful that more will follow suit with that. Mr. Smith, um, in my district, we have Hyundai that is um, building one of their EV plants. In fact, it is the largest economic development project in the history of the state of Georgia. Um, a five and a half billion dollar investment that's going to create over 8,100 jobs, plus probably that many more in ancillary businesses. So we're very excited about it. They've announced that they have um, no plans to remove AM radios from their vehicles as well. So we're, we're encouraged to hear that. Um, can you explain to me why some of the OEMs um, plan to keep AM and others don't? I mean, what's the rationale here? Well, first off, I can't really comment on individual OEM plans, but I will say our manufacturers are very consumer focused and they run focus groups, et cetera, and they look at their various product portfolios and the kind of consumers that use their products and what they want. So I can't say much more than that and other than the fact that it seems like some of our members are um, see value in it. And uh, all of our members, though, see value in providing the full network of, of the IPAWS alerts, and we certainly support that and commit to that. I keep hearing that interference with the, um, with the EV batteries is a problem, that um, 
uh, static and that type of thing. Is, is, is that true? Well, I mean, in general, AM has issues with static and interference. That's something that FEMA's documented. But um, I can't say much in terms of very specifics because, again, EVs, even within EVs, are different. They have a number of different motors, different components, different pla places where they're placed. So um, I don't have any particular specific information about the type of shielding or the type of, uh, of um, rec or, uh, recommendations they do or remediations they do in terms of filtering to be able to uh, pull out some of that uh, static. I, you know, I just got to tell you, I'm a little skeptical of that. I, I have to believe that, you know, if they really wanted to, they could fix that problem. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Um, Lieutenant Colonel DeMasi, um, while you serve the great state of New Jersey, as I say, can you tell me how, how my constituents in Georgia 1 would fare in a Category 5 hurricane without AM radio? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, when those survivors don't have a sense of what's happening around them, it, it tends to affect adversely their decision-making processes, whether it's to shelter in place or maybe to evacuate. And we want to make sure that those survivors have most critical, up-to-date information possible. Uh, New Jersey, through the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, has assisted Georgia in providing generators in the past to help support power during And we appreciate crisis. that, and it does not go unnoted. Yes, sir. We, we definitely know in a, how important it is to make sure some of those critical pieces of infrastructure come back online as swiftly as possible. And, uh, you know, part of that process is making sure that, you know, you're effectively communicating with your public and AM uh, has that ability to transcend some of those other challenges to the infrastructure. Mr. Chapman, real quick, um, you mentioned in your testimony that AM radio helps those who have poor wireless and broadband signals stay connected. And, uh, you know, again, South Georgia, we don't have the best broadband. We've got some, and, and it's good, but we don't have the, the best. Um, but we got a lot of agriculture. So this would impact um, those in our agriculture sector as well. Um, what What... While this proves that we have a lot of work to do, and particularly on this committee to improve broadband, rural broadband, can you please share the, the um, volume and type of information that these um, communities receive through AM radio? So thank you for the question, Congressman. Uh, we have a lot of ag and farm information that we have on our stations, and uh, a lot of that goes on our AM radio stations. It's very important because that's how it's received by those communities. And it's also important to point out that those communities have other ways to receive things, but it's easiest for them when they're out in a combine, something like that, to have it on the AM radio. They have other means, but they still choose. And ag uh, information across radio is one of the most important ways it's delivered today. Good. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. And the chair now recognizes the gentleman from California's 29th district for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for having this important hearing. Um, for some people, radio, specifically AM radio, is an outdated medium with a shrinking consumer base. However, in Latino communities, like the one I represent in the San Fernando Valley, radio is one of the most powerful um, and far-reaching forms of media. In November of last year, Nielsen Media Research reported that 97% of Latinos over the age of 18 listen to radio in some form every month. This phenomenon is not unique only to the Latino community. Racial and ethnic minorities in my state and across this country turn to radio for content that is more inclusive of their stories, their culture, and their experiences, and their languages. Uh, Mr. Chapman, I know my colleagues have asked about uh, this because it's an important issue. Can you speak further to what factors allow AM radio to target underserved minority communities more effectively than other broadcast mediums and whether or not um, radio is um, in one or more languages in America? Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, an oftentimes overlooked aspect of diversity and voice is the access to entry. And what I'm talking about is the price of a radio station. So AM radio stations are typically much less expensive today 
than FM radio stations. What that means is somebody wanting to break into our industry that has a, a desire to speak to a specific community, a voice or, or a community of color, um, uh, has the opportunity to get into broadcast ownership where it might be much more difficult with a large general market signal. So that's a very important aspect of how they talk uh, to the community that they're targeting. Um, it's, while it's often overlooked, um, that relationship ultimately, as you reference uh, the high percentage in the Latino community of listening to the station, it is very similar, which also occurs in the African American community. Um, stations that have a diverse uh, uh, listener base oftentimes have the strongest listener base because of the relationship uh, with that community. So cultural competency and ownership does in fact uh, create an environment where this, the business has stands a, a higher likelihood of reaching more people, therefore being more successful? Absolutely. I can tell you by experience when I was general sales manager of WTLC AM in Indianapolis, if we did not have a message on the air uh, relating to a particular situation, uh, our audience base oftentimes would doubt that it actually was existing or taking place. That relationship, again, is central. Okay. So despite recent improvements, the number of minority-owned commercial broadcast stations still lags significantly, significantly behind the representational share of the U.S. population. Uh, Mr. Chapman, as somebody with experience in purchasing and operating radio stations, I'm wondering if you might have some thoughts or initiatives Congress can take to encourage others to follow your path and expand the number of minority-owned commercial radio stations across the country. All right. Thank you for the question, Congressman. Our industry is at the best when we're reflective of the communities where we operate. Uh, there is an unspoken charge that the radio stations need to speak to the people that are available in the community. And uh, a number of years ago, there was the uh, tax certificate that was available for diverse groups. As broadcasters, we would welcome to see that type of thing in place once again because we know the more that we have a citizenry that is informed of the issues that are taking place, it's the best way to guide people through tough times. Yes, uh, it, it's very important because the, you mentioned earlier uh, what it takes to enter into that industry, that business. It, there are some barriers. Um, uh, we um, mourn the loss of somebody who owned radio stations, television stations, who got his opportunity in the early 1970s when the FCC actually said, you know, let's see if we can entice minorities to go ahead and get involved in ownership. And that was Walter Ulloa out of Los Angeles. Uh, grew up in uh, a poor side of town, but ended up doing very, very well and brought a tremendous cultural competency to every station that he was a part of. Um, and therefore was incredibly successful. Um, so one of the things that I'd like to, to see happen, and, and we don't have enough time today, is to see some of uh, your recommendations uh, uh, forwarded to this committee, uh, examples of the past where we've been successful in getting more uh, participation, and then also some, maybe some innovative things we could do going forward. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida's second district for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Latta. As we've all heard today, uh, AM radio continues to be important. Uh, it offers a broad range of programming and essential emergency announcements are transmitted classically on the AM bands. Uh, uh, given the long wavelength of AM radio, we can hear from stations hundreds of miles away, which makes this an ideal form of communications in emergencies. Uh, I'm aware that technology innovations bring changes to the status quo. and We now have FM and satellite radio and internet, et cetera. But, but when the prominent lines of communications fail, when individuals can't access the internet uh, or when there's a natural disaster, AM radio is the last resort. I don't, for the life of me, I'm not sure why we're discussing getting rid of that at this point particular juncture. I have a few questions for you. Uh, Colonel DeMace, uh, thank you for your time with the panel today. Uh, <clears throat> with your background as a Deputy Director of Emergency Management and many previous roles in this field, I think you know the importance of effective communications during emergencies. And Mr. Chapman, your, your experience in broadcasting is certainly germane as well. In the Florida Panhandle, we suffered a Category 5 
hurricane that seriously impacted our lives and our communications. We literally lost all cell phones, landlines, internet, and even our police radio repeaters for nearly two weeks. What we didn't lose was AM radio. <laughs> Uh, so with the potential removal of a AM radios uh, from most of the major automobile manufacturers, do you think FEMA will be able to communicate effectively with individuals during disasters? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the redundancy that we have uh, built within the um, integrated public alert and warning system relies upon the AM radio uh, as its most reliable form of communication during those critical moments when those high winds and, and other factors can destroy the actual cellular infrastructure or other means of communication uh, with which we have to communicate with the public uh, during a crisis. So uh, I think FEMA recognizes and they recognize we have yeah. that it's incredibly important to touch. Mr. Chapman, same question. Congressman, thank you. I, I believe that uh, there's all kinds of redundancies that are built into the EAS system. That's why it works well. But for the reasons that we've pointed out, AM sits at the very beginning of the chain. Um, the AM stations are far superior to the other mechanisms uh, in, in uh, the emergency alert system to start it. It's why we chose for 75 percent of the primary entry point stations to be AM radio stations. That's, that sounds like a strong, uh, strong affirmation. And Mr. Schmidt, do you have a feeling how much it costs to put an AM radio in a car? No, I don't have an actual cost uh, for an AM radio. Again, it probably varies between individual manufacturers, and those are proprietary and closely held. Um, but again, we are committed and to providing the alerts across the full spectrum of the IPAWS system, and we also have provide just a vast offer of choices for our manufacturers. And oh, by the way, there's still 99% of vehicles on the road today that have AM radio. So we will have AM radio for quite a while as we look at the future and see what makes sense in terms of uh, the iPod system and FEMA's approach. Thank you. So I, I guess I, I'll close on this note. There are 82 million Americans listening to AM radio and there are 2 million Americans driving electric vehicles. I, I think it's a pretty obvious thing to leave the AM radios alone. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, AM radio may seem arcane to some. We've already seen in this hearing it currently serves as the backbone of our nation's emergency alert system, providing an important backstop in times of need and has proven its continued reliability as other networks fail, which is why the announcement by some automakers to remove AM radio from cars has raised significant concerns for Americans. There are valid questions regarding the overall reach of various forms of emergency communications, the depth of information provided by those alerts, free access to alerts, and the resiliency of the infrastructure required to provide these alerts. It is crucial we ensure that all Americans can freely access life-saving information in times of need through interrelated, innovative, and overlapping forms of emergency communication systems. But at the same time, we can't ignore stymie technological innovation. Let me start with you, Mr. Schmidt. In your testimony, you mentioned that the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System Program Management Office emphasized in its strategic plan for fiscal year 22-26, difficulties of moving away from radio and broadcast as the primary channels for news and information. In your estimation, if we had an emergency right now, during this very hearing, would you say that the current IPAS system is fully equipped to serve and reach every American in times of emergency without assistance from AM radio? Yes or no? I can't opine on- Yes or no, please. Madam Chairman, I mean, sorry. <laughs> Congressman Woman Dingo. No, I do not have the ability to answer that question because I am not FEMA. I am not the government. I am not the one that developed this, the program. 
we are the ones that work with that program to try to support it the best we can. Well, I have talked to them. And the fact of the matter is, based on my conversations, that we are not currently adequately prepared to reach all Americans in the event of a disaster without the assistance of AM radio services as a backdrop. I'm grateful that all the members of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation have committed to providing multiple channels of free emergency alert access to consumers. But we need to get far more specific about how they receive these alerts. Mr. Schmidt, can you share with us through what medium consumers can expect to receive free emergency alerts in automobiles moving forward? Is it digital, analog, FM, AM, satellite, or another technology? And are the companies approaching the issue differently? Thank you for the question. Um, yes, with respect to free, that varies between mediums and even within mediums. So I can't comment. So that's a very basic sense. question However, here. What I will say is there are certainly, for example, satellite, where satellite has um, their free Barker channel, which is always there and runs and is without subscription. And there are a lot of the analog C and other mechanisms which are free as well. So, Mr. Chairman, I am going to suggest, uh, for instance, by the way, Tesla does not offer AM now in its vehicles. I believe that this committee should ask every manufacturer whether they're going to how long, what the commitment is, how much it's going to cost, is it going to be streamed, and when they say it's going to be free, what's the definition of free? Now, Mr. Schmidt, how have your member companies also ensured that this medium remains resilient in times of crisis or when wireless network outages occur? Well, again, like I said, iPods is a network of stuff, so it, depending on the uh, specific um, <laughs> event, certain mediums are maybe more appropriate than others, and that's why there's... But not everybody may have access because everybody's not telling us exactly how they're going to make sure they have access to those free. Mr. Schmidt, when it, will these emergency alert services come standard in all new vehicles? Is this commitment the same across all member companies, or will there be differences in terms of what emergency communication services they will receive in their new vehicles? Well, I can't comment on individual manufacturers on what exactly is in their program, but there is a commitment that there will be at least some post three emergency alert received through those vehicles. But we don't know whether it's going to be ongoing. I'm going to clearly say consumers should not bear the cost of receiving life-saving emergency information, period. I think it's important that every member company you represent be unambiguously clear about how consumers will receive these alerts free of charge and standard in new vehicles. I have other questions I'd like to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses. Uh, listen, I come to this meeting a huge fan of AM radio. I remember uh, in the 1980s, I'll date myself, I used to travel uh, in Colorado, and I could uh, listen, tune in to the Salt Lake City AM radio station and listen to local football games and local news. And, um, of course, um, I, I, like many of my colleagues here, want to make sure that AM radio is vibrant and, and is viable for, for many years into the future. But if I'm honest, um, I'm a little conflicted with the concept of the federal government mandating um, how that is done. And so I come to this hearing with an open mind, not with a predetermined judgment, but just simply an open mind. Um, some of those memories also include eight-track tapes, uh, cigarette lighters, uh, manual windows. And um, I find myself asking, gosh, you know, if the eight-track tape industry had lobbied for a mandate to keep eight-track tapes, would we still be listening to eight-track tapes? And I don't think so. Um, so, Mr. Chapman, let's, let's agree that uh, the vibrancy of AM radio is important for entertainment, for education, and clearly, as we've heard today, for emergency situations. But as I travel my district, and I would challenge anybody to have a more rural district than I have in Utah, as a matter of fact, half of my district is actually frontier, I have more success streaming uh, than I do actually getting AM radio signals. And I'm just wondering if we set aside this concept about the cars for just a minute, isn't the vibrancy of AM radio um, really contingent on a transition uh, to streaming? And, and should we be having 
uh, more conversations, right, about um, how to do that. Look, when I'm here in Washington, D.C., I like to listen to that same local AM station. When I jog on the mall, I can listen to news back home. And um, I don't really care about even an emergency warning here in D.C. Um, I would care about one back more in my district. So could you just explore with me, like, the future of AM radio? And if, if we all agree we want to keep it vibrant, uh, shouldn't we, we be spending more time uh, talking of, uh, about um, transitioning to kind of a new world? Congressman, I appreciate the question. I think it's a fair question. Um, one of the things, we all come with preconceived notions. And one of those is uh, when you reference eight track tapes from many years ago, um, I'm part of the generation that grew up with that. And when I listen to AM radio today, I hear static, uh, and it doesn't sound with the same fidelity that FM radio sounds. Um, but for the reasons I pointed out earlier, there are clear superior advantages uh, for AM radio in times of emergency. And so uh, I also recognize uh, uh, that we've discussed that at length this morning. But I think that safety point is... So I guess my point is there's far higher likelihood that I will hear that outside of my car than inside my car. I don't have a car here in D.C. Some of my staff doesn't have a car. And yet, if we explore ways for people to access AM radio, aren't, aren't we actually ensuring far more likelihood that they would get those uh, alerts if, if we're making sure that everybody can access AM radio, really, almost no matter where they are with today's technology? Uh, by the way, during the hearing, my staff prompted me, and I just put, looked on Amazon, you can buy an AM radio for about $5. For, so those of you who want to know what it costs to add it to a car, Right. So this is not a cost issue, right? It, it, it maybe is a technology issue and where, where we're going in the future issue. Yeah, I'll give you a chance to respond. Then I want to ask a couple more questions. Congressman, one last point. It was back in January. We were moving our daughter from Denver up to Seattle. And so we drove through large sections of Utah, um, you know, in our 2013 Toyota Avalon. It's a hybrid. And I can listen to AM radio in that car through that stretch. And there were times where there was not an FM station, and there were times when there weren't AM stations. And they both complement each other in some of those more I, rural areas. I agree. Areas. And just for simply for time, I'm going to move on. I would tell you, though, I can better access that AM streaming in my car in rural Utah than I can frequently with stations. Um, Colonel, um, that cigarette lighter in my, in, in my parents' car was often used to start campfires and um, could be considered essential for emergencies. Uh, maybe only in rural Utah, right? So in your view, like, are we looking at this through the wrong paradigm? Should we be looking at, at, at new technology? And here again, not to, to, to diminish AM. I want AM to be part of whatever our solution is. But, but what role is new, are we, should we be looking to new technology and its advancements and, and not get stuck in a paradigm that it has to be a traditional AM radio as we think about it? Congressman, great question. Um, no, I think we're always. I, I got to get a super quick answer. Exploring, we're out of time. exploring new technologies. Uh, I agree with you 100%. But right now, it's currently constituted an emergency situation. The AM platform is critical to communicate. Okay, and I don't dispute that. It's not the AM platform. It's that thing that is our paradigm that has to be look and feel and act like an old AM radio that I'm questioning. I'm sorry, I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. I yield. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New Hampshire for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being with us. I think it's clear from the discussion today that AM radio remains a staple communication channel across the country, including my rural district. From music and talk shows to traffic updates and the news, AM radio is a trusted platform to connect people with what they want to listen to. Many AM broadcast radio stations operate locally and help to keep their listeners informed about what is happening in our community. Most critically, Americans know and trust they can tune into their local AM station to receive alerts and stay safe during emergencies, including snowstorms and other emergencies in my state. For anyone who's ever found themselves caught driving in a sun sudden storm, AM radio is where you turn to first. AM radio is especially important in rural communities where cell coverage can be spotty and broadband services may be limited, and that's classic for my district. For rural Americans, AM radio is a reliable and accessible way to stay connected when it matters most. And while Congress continues to work to connect rural communities and bridge the digital divide, AM radio remains an essential communications channel. 
That's why I joined our chairman, Mr. Lada, and Representative Pence in sending a letter seeking information from the major automakers on their plans to phase AM radios out of their vehicles. I remain concerned that removing the radios from new vehicles will put rural Americans at risk of not receiving critical emergency alerts and safety information. Lieutenant Colonel DeMays, can you elaborate on other available emergency communication tools and how these tools operate in rural areas? What are the alternatives? So in, in our rural areas, uh, when we push the message through uh, the integrated public alert and warning system, it hits uh, several different pieces of the architecture. One's communicating through those AM and FM platforms, certainly through the television. Uh, communi uh, communicating those critical messages, uh, but also it ties into WIA, the Wireless Emergency Alert System, uh, which again, depending upon the reach of those cellular towers, will hopefully be able to connect with those rural areas. But as we've seen, you know, uh, even in the areas uh, very adjacent to my area in southern New Jersey, which are very rural, some of that cellular reach is very limited. In some cases, that messaging doesn't necessarily reach. Get through. Thank you. AM radio is not the only emergency management tool available, but it's clearly our most reliable tool to reach the wide, widest audience at this time. While I recognize the importance of AM radio, I also support the innovation and development of new technologies. And I think this is where Mr. Curtis was going. Electric vehicles are the future of our nation's transportation system, and we must be careful not to stifle widespread deployment. Mr. Schmidt, how will a potential mandate to require AM radios in all vehicles impact the function and adoption of electric vehicles? Thank you for the uh, question. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, regulation is a blunt instrument, and it's, it goes to per, perpetuity. So even if you have vehicles that now have this technology, you're mandating them for forever, basically. And you're looking at a uh, system that FEMA has concerns about its uh, declining listenership. And we are looking at more and better ways of trying to deliver alerts. So uh, I'm, I think we're ge generally not against or not in favor of a mandate in this area. And again, uh, we, have, our commitment is that we are going to be providing as much through the IPAWS network as possible. Consumers have wide range of, of options, and currently there are about 99% of vehicles on the road, which that will not change dramatically in the next future. So we will have time to look at um, how we maybe evolve this system in a more positive way. Thank you. And, and one for, more for you, Mr. Schmidt, EV adoption in rural communities is already falling behind for a number of reasons. Will the removal of AM radios be yet another barrier to adoption of EVs in rural communities? Um, as I mentioned, I think we have a, pretty, a fairly reasonable array of uh, technologies that our EV customers can use to reach and um, get to these, uh, these alerts and et cetera. So um, I don't see it as being an impediment for EV penetration. Thank you. Congress has a delicate responsibility of protecting public safety without hampering innovation. And I look forward to our continuing discussion in this committee. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. 15 Jesus. seconds to spare. Well, actually it was 16 over. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll ignore that. <laughs> the, uh, the gentlelady's time has expired, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lada and Ranking Member Matsui for putting together today's hearing on AM radio. And thank you to the witnesses for providing such valuable insight. My district is in the heart of rural Pennsylvania. Many of my constituents, farmers and rural residents alike, rely every day on AM radio to receive their local news from weather to sports. We hear all too often that information is power, but in my district in Pennsylvania, the information is protection. With that knowledge, we know that FEMA relies on AM radio to provide alerts through the National Emergency Alert System to our communities.
thus the protection. With the increasing prevalence of electric vehicles, some have raised concern that the elimination of AM radio will restrict critical access to emergency alerts for those without cell phones. Some believe FM could soon follow. Despite millions of Americans still relying on radio for their news and various, tax, various talk shows, and ultimately for their protection. Mr. Chapman, given that AM radio is often used in times of severe weather and natural disasters, such as tornadoes and hurricanes, what kind of safeguards do these stations have in place to ensure that these alerts are able to reach as many people as possible? Thank you for the opportunity to comment on that, Congressman. I can tell you that every radio station that is part of the network, and it is virtually every station across the country, has certain protocols and systems that they have to adhere to. There's regular testing that takes place. And so unlike the other systems that are in place, we continually go through and make sure that free over-the-air radio is accessible and that there's not holes or gaps in our system. So having that extra layer of protection, having that testing in place to make sure that the holes and gaps are not present, particularly in areas like rural parts of America, do you feel that deleting AM radio will provide a national safety risk? So, so and, and I think that is the biggest question, obviously, that we're talking about right here, because uh, the AAS system has redundancies, you know, uh, We've talked about that this morning, but there are parts and roles that AM radio plays in it that cannot be substituted by other forms. You know, uh, it was chosen, and we've talked about it a couple of times, as the primary entry point for the national alerts that go out. And the reason for that is, is those radio stations cover 90% of the United States. There are 60 of the 70-some radio stations that are PEP stations that cover the entire network. And that is the most reliable method that we have in any time of crisis. And that reliability is important. Colonel DeMays, how many cell phones are not capable of the wireless emergency alerts? And could those that are non-capable cell phones be at risk without AM radio to missing emergency, amber and presidential alerts, especially in rural communities? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. I don't have the data on uh, on what that would turn out to be, but I can only state that um, having the AM radio available to communicate those messages out as a backup, whether or not that cellular device is functioning or not, is of critical importance. And as a follow-up, are individuals currently able to opt out of these imminent threat and amber alerts through the WARN Act, defeating the function of this system? And without those mobile alerts, what are the remaining ways to be notified of severe weather, or are these communication systems in the near future going to be implemented to reach rural constituents like mine during an emergency? Again, I'm, I'm not aware of uh, the process of opting out of certain messaging uh, as per the process, but uh, I can state that we will still leverage other platform forms through the integrated public alert and warning systems, such as television, um, we have the ability to leverage other sources of communications, such as reverse 911, where we could hit hardline phones uh, or the through the Resident Connect program. But there, there are multiple means to build that redundancy in communicating with the public. But again, as mentioned throughout the hearing this morning, AM radio is the most consistent, dependable, and reliable, particularly for those areas uh, that are more rural. And I think it's worth, as my time diminishes here, repeating that AM radio is the most consistent, reliable form of communication that we have right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. I yield. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.